Good afternoon. And on behalf of the Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation, I extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us for today's high level event on Africa's forest elephants. My name is John Scanlon. I'm the CEO of the EPI Foundation, and we have a wonderful program planned for you today. Firstly, a reminder that today's event is being broadcast in both English and in French. And to hear us, you must select your preferred language from the interpretation icon at the bottom of the page, as you'll see from the slide that is on screen now. I hope that you've all managed to find it and you are free to switch between languages at any time. We are most grateful to our friends at the World Tourism Forum Lucerne for their financial support, which has enabled us to put on today's event. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of the US Department of State, INL, for the support they give us in securing the ivory stockpiles in Cameroon, Gabon, Nigeria, and Ivory Coast. In May and September of last year, we hosted two high-level events. And today we are delighted to be joined by VIP speakers from Cameroon, Gabon, Liberia, and Nigeria, together with the co-founder of Rebalance Earth and the chair of the IUCN SCC Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force. We are deeply grateful to all of our VIP speakers for agreeing to participate in today's event, which is being moderated by one of Africa's leading wildlife conservationists, Dr. Winnie Kiru, who is our Director of Government Relations. But before I hand over to Winnie to moderate the high-level discussion and question and answer session, we will share with you an exclusive and thought-provoking film on the plight of the forest elephants living in Nigeria's Omo Forest Reserve. And we extend our thanks to the Leventus Foundation for the support in enabling us to make this film. Finally, a big thank you to the more than 650 people who have registered to join us today, including ministers and high-level officials from across all of our 21 member states. We will now play for you the short film from the Omo Forest Reserve, following which we will go straight to our good friend and colleague, Winnie, to moderate today's discussion. Thank you. This is one of Nigeria's last rainforests, or more, incredibly, just 100 kilometers from downtown Lagos and a vital source of water for the city, also home to chimpanzees, rare birds, and forest elephants. But almost trees and its wildlife could soon disappear. As we traveled in, we saw the timber coming out. Many of these loggers have government permits. Others work illegally, often at night. Either way, almost trees are being cut down quicker than they can grow. Omo is a forest reserve of some 1,300 square kilometers administered by the local Ogun state. A small part is, in theory, a strict nature reserve in which logging and hunting is banned. Nigerian conservationists want this area to expand. Emmanuel Olabode leads a team of just 12 unarmed rangers protecting Omo and its elusive, perhaps 100 forest elephants. From where we are standing, we can see that there are elephant trails all around us. There's one that goes this way, it's very clear. There's one that goes this way, which is also clear. You can see fresh prints of elephant. They, they visit this, uh, this place to come and just have a scrape from this route and get the minerals so to optimize their body metabolism. Let's get two or three camera traps okay. and come and put it around and see uh, how many elephants will come. The rangers rarely see the elephants, but they can monitor them with these camera traps. Yeah. 
The major problem in Omo includes um, farming activities, logging, hunting, and human settlements. In fact, now we have many camps propping up within the core area of the elephants. So that is really affecting the elephants. The forest is fragmented. In many places, now a patchwork of villages and farms. Thousands of people farm in Omo illegally. The soil is good for cocoa, and people have to make a living. Local hunters have guns, making it difficult for the rangers to stop those who enter the nature reserve. We are somehow worried about our safety because we are not equipped by any arm. We are just here and we are facing some challenges from poachers, hunters around here, and all of them are moving with ammunition. So anytime that we want to go to the field, we will be scared of maybe how to meet them on the road, how they are going to attack us on the road. The rangers hear a gunshot. They run to where it came from. But they don't catch the hunter. In 2020, the rangers were threatened by armed loggers. They no longer patrol in that part of Omo. And as the forest is turned into farms, people and elephants are coming into contact more and more. This can be dangerous for both of them. This is a big one. The, big, the mighty one. Yeah. The mighty elephant. Yeah. Two. Can't tell by the size. Guys. We need more political will. And uh, if it continues this way, in the next 10 years, uh, elephant in Omo might be a history. And we don't want that to, to happen. We need intervention at the uh, st uh, state level and possibly at the federal level. Omo is being plundered. But with the right management, it could provide sustainable benefits to local people and Nigeria's economy and be a safe haven for its precious elephants. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings everyone. I am Dr. Winnie Cairo of the EPI Foundation. I'm speaking to you from my home country, Kenya. I'm your moderator for today. Thank you for joining us. I have seen people from all over the world. We welcome you. We have hundreds of people on this web. I hope you have enjoyed the film on the very beautiful Omo Forest. And in a moment, we will hear from the Nigerian government, followed by other key governments in West and Central Africa. But first, a reminder, we will have 20 minutes of question and answer session after our VIP speeches. So please submit your written questions in the Q&A box so that we will be able to answer them. We'd love to hear from all over Africa. So if you have questions in French, in English, please write them down in the language that you feel comfortable in. If you're following this event on social media, you may have seen our hashtags in the chat. They are at coexistence and at African voices. This event today is also being recorded. 
It is now my enormous pleasure to introduce the Honorable Minister Sharon Ikiazo, Minister of State for the Environment from Nigeria, who is joining us now. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my colleague ministers from Gabon and Cameroon, Mr. Lee White and Jules Ndongo, the Director of Elephant uh, Protection Initiative, Mr. Philip Barnaby. It's my absolute pleasure to be part of this event today, being a continuation of interventional efforts to save the critically endangered forest elephants. You would all agree with me that the precarious situation in which these elephants are today calls for urgent and drastic actions in order to save these natural treasures. Across the African continent, factors such as overpopulation, deforestation, desertification, unsustainable agricultural practices, and climate change are responsible for terrestrial and marine ecosystem degradation, biodiversity loss, disease outbreaks, including the pandemics we are facing today, and other environmental hazards. We all realize that forests are critical components of the ecosystem as they provide natural habitats for wildlife. But between the 1970s to mid 1990s, forests covered about 10% of our land area. But this has reduced drastically to less than 6% with deforestation rate at 4% per annum. Elephants have been part of our history and are part of our heritage in Nigeria. We are concerned that elephants, particularly forest elephants, are the brink of extinction. And this red signal explains why drastic action is needed to be taken urgently to salvage the situation. Forest elephants have suffered 86% population decline over the past 50 years. Presently, the current population of elephants in Nigeria is estimated to be just 305. Omo Forest Reserve used to be the home to abundant elephant population in Nigeria. But now, only those of us who are old enough can recount with nostalgia how students and vehicles stopped along the road for these creatures to cross. We face major challenges in balancing the need for development and conservation. Our growing human population is hungry for land and resources. Deforestation, loss of habitat, poverty, population increase, and poaching are the biggest threats to our few hundred surviving elephants. However, on the part of the government of Nigeria, enabling policies, law and legislative framework have been and are being developed, reviewed and implemented to strengthen and facilitate the protection and conservation of these iconic species and also protect their habitats. We have recently validated the National Strategy for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crimes, which was domesticated from the West African Strategy. The strategy is due for launch on the 3rd of March during the World Wildlife Day celebration. We are also working with our international partners to review the Endangered Species Act and develop the National Wildlife Crime Act to deal with in-country and trans-border wildlife crime. As you may be aware, we are also developing our National Elephant Action Plan in collaboration with Wildlife Conservation Society. And this is through the support of Elephant Protection Initiative. The federal government's commitment to increasing the nation's forest cover through the ongoing National Afforestation Program will go a long way in accelerating the protection and population of the elephants and other endangered species. Furthermore, Nigeria's protected areas are being expanded with the recent approval by President Muhammad Buhari to establish 10 additional national parks across the ecological zones of the country, including the rainforest zone that is home to forest elephants. This action is a positive development as recent assessments show that some of these forest elephants have stabilized in well-managed conservation areas such as the Yankari Game Reserve, which also harbors the largest population of these elephant species in Nigeria. As a signatory 
to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES. We are working with relevant organizations such as uh, Elephant uh, Protection Initiative Foundation, monitoring the illegal killing of elephants, Mike, WCS Wild Aid, African Nature Investment Foundation to ensure increased efforts towards regular monitoring, protection, and conservation of elephants within our national territory. The menace of illegal wildlife trade is being confronted in collaboration with relevant partners. Being mindful of Nigeria's ill reputation as a transit hub for the illicit wildlife trade, capacities of relevant agencies are being strengthened in enforcement, investigation, prosecution, and stockpile management. This is evident in the number of seizures of ivory and other wildlife products in recent times at our borders. Curtailing this menace will require looking beyond our borders. So to this end, we are accelerating the signing of the Cooperation Framework Agreement on Transboundary Ecosystem Conservation and Sustainable Management of Forestry and Wildlife Resources with the Republic of Cameroon and hope to do same with other countries identified in the illicit trade network. Our enforcement agency, Nigeria, is improving its operational procedures by strengthening physical security in the storerooms, improved capacity building, as well as the upgrading of digital inventory system. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me reiterate our determination and unwavering commitment to achieving more with the support of our partners until the fight against exploitation of our biodiversity resources is won. I commend EPI Foundation for its invaluable contributions towards the protection and conservation of elephants. We will not relent on our efforts as we continue to preserve our natural resources for future generations. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much for that wonderful message. We are really grateful that the minister from Nigeria was able to send us that message. And I know you have all learned and, and listened carefully to uh, the Nigerian government. I want to now introduce uh, a minister that is very known, well known to many of you, Professor Lee White from Gabon is a leading conservationist and a member of the EPI Leadership Council. And of course, Gabon, as you know, is a stronghold of Africa's forest elephants. Professor Lee White, we really want to hear your message. Thank you. Sorry, I was talking to myself. Um, I said, thank you so much. It's great to see both my colleague Sharon and Jules uh, on this call. Um, I'm very encouraged to hear about Nigeria's commitment to create 10 new national parks. That's amazing. And to see Nigeria and uh, Cameroon working together, I can't help but think that we should add Gabon to that daisy chain. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been surveying for, looking for, studying forest elephants for pretty much all of my professional life. I, I started in Sierra Leone in the early 1980s in the Gola Forest, uh, but never saw an elephant. I saw, I came, my closest encounter was old dung. Uh, I worked for a Nigeria Conservation Foundation um, way back when, 87, 88 in Komu Forest, which is very similar to Omo uh, in Cross River. Um, again, I, I, the closest I got was fresh dung in Okomu and, and, and Cross River. When I moved from Nigeria to Gabon in 1989, within 15 minutes of arriving in Lope National Park, I had my first forest elephant charge, uh, literally. Uh, I got off a train into a car and 15 minutes later, I had a family group of forest elephants within five meters. Um, and I arrived in Gabon, I actually inherited the, the Suzuki Jeep that had just done Gabon's national survey of forest elephants led by Richard Barnes 
um, and his wife Karen from WCS and Allard Blom, who's now at WWF, and, and Marcel Ellers. And they estimated about 60,000 forest elephants in Gabon, which was quite a revolution in our understanding of forest elephant numbers. Um, that came on the back of Caroline Chewton's survey of gorillas that showed there were 35,000 gorillas in, in Gabon. And so that really got um, conservation uh, 20 years on, I became Gabon's National Parks Agency. Uh, so I, I went from scientist to conservation politician to, to I jumped ship from WCS to work for the Gabonese government and, and, and I ended up being appointed by President Ali Bongo to run the National Park Service. And the first, basically the first action I had to undertake as head of AM was to go to war. Um, we discovered a uh, almost 7,000 people cross-border poaching um, out later, feeding in into the sort of Boko Haram network. And we discovered that we had lost something like 25,000 elephants in Minkebe National Park. Um, um, we didn't find 25,000 carcasses. We found it also ran away because we all know that the elephants are, are in and mobile. Um, it was President Ali Bongo to, to visit the National Park Agency troops on the front line to see for himself. He brought um, several five star generals um, because it was obvious to him as the head of state. It was obvious to me as head of the parks that um, maintaining peace and security in Gabon um, cannot be dissociated from natural resource governance. Tragically, if you look around Africa, countries that have lost their elephants, be they forest or savannah elephant, often have so there's a direct correlation between elephant governance and, 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 and peace and security. Ten years on, I'm now the Minister of Forestry. We completed a nationwide elephant survey last year with um, various partners. We used the new method, DNA capture recapture, which doesn't rely on measuring how long dung piles sit in the forest and, and how often um, elephants poop. And we estimated 95,000 forest elephants in Gabon. So, so whilst across the range of forest elephants, uh, we've lost up to 75,000, Gabon has seen its, its population increase by, by 50%. Um, that's good news. Uh, it's required incredible commitment from the president, from the government, from the military, from the parks agency. We've had to transform biologists into commando troops. We've had people shot at, we've had people shot, even killed. Um, but we have managed to push back the front and we're still reproducing. Our elephants are still reproducing faster than they're dying. Um, so that's good news. Look to the future. What are the threats of easier for Gabon? Um, it seems to be going off the charts. People are complaining every day. Um, and we risk losing the support of the Gabonese people for not just for elephants, but for conservation as a whole, 
because the human elephant conflict has become so acute. And so it's desperately important that we deal with this crisis, we build elephant fences, and we can look for other solutions. thing for me, it's sort of a medium term threat is climate change. Uh, Jules and I were in, in COP26 in, in Glasgow. We've shown in Gabon in local way that losing fruit production in the rainforest the elephants are going hungry. We think that we've been the, the, the food they have in, in the rainforest, habitat degradation, and eventuality if we don't um, restrict ocean. Well, yeah, the, the conclusion um, is that. You know, there's a link between elephants and forests and carbon sequestration, integrity of natural resources, um, governance of natural resources, and the integrity of our countries and our planet. Um, and if we lose the elephants, we're going to lose control of our, 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 our natural systems and our countries. And, and, and so um, we have to win this, this battle for preservation of the elephant. Thank, thank you very much, Professor White. Um, unfortunately, the, the link was a little bit dodgy, so there may be some people who didn't get to hear everything, but we certainly got the important parts. We got that Gabon is celebrating a success story that, uh, uh, and this is due to the, re the great investment in uh, serious uh, conservation effort security and, really that success story is something that everybody who knows how forest elephants have had a difficult time must just celebrate. Thank you very much, Professor White. I, for those who have joined us, I just want to appreciate people joining us from all over the world. Some of you are actually up very late to listen to us. Thank you very much. I want you to look at the chat to see our um, hashtags hashtag coexistent, hashtag African voices. Uh, those are the hashtags that we're using today. And now I will quickly take us to Cameroon, another critical country for the conservation of uh, forest elephants. Uh, the Minister of Forestry and Wildlife, uh, Jules, uh, Honorable Jules Dongo is traveling. And he has arranged for uh, Secretary General in the Ministry, Joseph Nguyen, who joins us from Yaoundé uh, to read the message on his behalf. So let's listen to the message from Cameroon. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, Federal Minister for the Republic of Nigeria, the Honorable Minister of Forest, Oceans, Environment and Climate Change, Republic of Gabon, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Republic of uh, Liberia, the Honorable Chairperson of the Working Group on Human Wildlife, Conflict and Lead Researcher at USCN Oxford University, the Deputy Director of the Institute for Capacity Building of the IMF and co-founder of uh, Rebalance Earth, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, EPF, distinguished fellow panelists, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to speak today on behalf of the government of Cameroon on the critical issue of forest elephant conservation. Mr. Jules Doret Ndongo, Minister of Forestry and Wildlife of the Republic of Cameroon is unavailable. He instructed me to represent him at this meeting. I'm taking this floor on his behalf, as he so rightly stated, I'm uh, the uh, permanent secretary in charge of the Ministry of Forests and Fauna in Cameroon. Cameroon is a country blessed with extraordinary biodiversity. Within our borders, we find a wide variety of habitats and species. 
our elephants to take just this example, live in such different landscapes, such as the dry savannas of the north, the mountain slopes of mountain, Mount Cameroon in the southwest, and the dense forest of the southeast. Indeed, we're lucky to be one of the few African countries that has a large population of uh, both uh, savanna and forest elephants. In short, uh, I would like to concentrate myself on the challenges of conserving forest elephants. Ladies and gentlemen, talking about different types of challenges when it comes to elephant conservation, we are forever facing the scourge of organized elephant poaching for their ivory. We experienced it this month again in December 2021, uh, when poachers killed at least eight elephants in Lobeke National Park in the eastern region along the border with the Central African Republic. We believe that several dozen armed poachers have been infiltrating this area. And as a mark of my government determination to counter this threat, we deployed military forces to assist strangers who were able to make some arrests and secure some intelligence. These poachers are killing elephants for their ivory. They take the tusks and abandon the rest of the elephant's carcass. This is an international criminal network. Our investigation and interrogations of the suspects have revealed that the traffickers network go beyond national borders. This implies that poach ivory can be smuggled from one country to the other and even transit in several countries before getting to its final destination, which in most cases uh, is Asia. My government is determined to stop the killing of elephants and trafficking of ivory, but we're also dependent on international cooperation with friendly neighboring countries and our partners, both in the West and Asia. In this regard, I wish to share an example of cooperation that my country Cameroon had with the Republic of Gabon, whereby Cameroon authorities seized 187 pieces of ivory in Ambam town in the south region of Cameroon reported to come from Gabon um, in October 2020. After the seizure, the Gabonese authorities were informed and they decided to send a team of experts from their national agency for national parks to work with Cameroonian counterpart to collect samples of the said ivory for DNA analysis at the forensic laboratory in Gabon. The analysis enabled us to know, to determine that uh, all elephants killed originated from Central African region, amongst which are countries such as Gabon. It was also noticed that the presence of uh, haplotypes known in Cameroon, Congo, Central African Republic, and Democratic Republic of Congo. By the same token, I'm pleased to inform you that my government has been working with the EPI Foundation in a bid to put in place a pilot program to secure ivory stockpiles here in the capital Yaoundé and also in Mbam Jebiram National Park. We hope this program can expand and together with similar programs the API Foundation is carrying out in Gabon, Nigeria and Benin, we see it as a, a clear sign of the kind of original initiative we need to encourage in order to stop the scourge of ivory poaching. There are other challenges that we face in forest elephant conservation. As some have said today, we need to balance the need of development conservation. Our human population is growing and it needs lands and resources. Forest clearance for agriculture and other activities inevitably result in conflicts between people and elephants. We witnessed it in Cameroon last September when we had protests by villagers on the edge of Mount Cameroon National Park. Uh, the people were understandably upset. The elephant had destroyed homes as well as the fields of beans, corn, bananas, and plantain. Unfortunately, we have reports according to which two elephants were killed in revenge. It should be noted that um, Mount Cameroon was gazetted as a national park in 2009, and since then, its elephant population has grown from less than 170 to about 300 but such successes bring along problems with them. Uh, so we are particularly attentive and interested to hear discussions about human elephant conflicts today and learn of ways in which 
uh, these problems can be resolved or at least mitigated. Finally, I would like to thank the EPI Foundation for bringing us here together. And I want to assure the participants of this event of Cameroon's continued determination to conserve forest elephants and to work with all neighboring countries to ensure success in this regard. Thank you for your very kind attention. Merci. Thank you very much um, for speaking on behalf of the government of Cameroon and Honorable Jules Dongo, who was very keen to be with us today, but unfortunately he had to travel. We have heard about uh, the challenges of conserving elephants in Gabon, uh, sorry, Cameroon. And now we are moving on swiftly. We're going to a country that has wonderful biodiversity, some very large areas of surviving rainforest. This is Liberia. And we have with us Honorable Mike Dorian, the Managing Director of the Liberian uh, Forestry Development Authority, the government body that is responsible for the conservation of forest. Honorable Dorian is speaking from Monrovia. Thank you and welcome. Distinguished fellow panelists and guests, it is a great pleasure for me to speak today on behalf of the government of Liberia on the critical issue of forest elephant conservation. Indeed, Liberia as the most densely forested country in West Africa, with the largest portion of the remaining upper Guinea forest, is a vital player in any effort to conserve forest elephants. I'm sure everyone here today is familiar with the recent history we have gone through in Liberia. The devastation of war and later the Ebola epidemic, which have made nature conservation especially challenging. Despite this, we have made progress in recent years. Liberia was the first West African country to join the EPI in 2015, and in 2017 completed our National Elephant Action Plan. I'm able to share with you all some positive examples resulting from our demonstrated commitment towards the protection of forest elephants. You may have heard of two migrating elephants which came from Guinea in 2020. Wandered across Nima County and Grand Guinea County in Liberia and on to Côte d'Ivoire before eventually returning to Liberia. These elephants became famous in Liberia, with large crowds coming out, of, out to see them. We at the Forestry Development Authority responded quickly to the situation. I and my team were on ground in Nima and Grand Gide, ensuring the safety of both elephants and local people. I think we learned some important lessons here. The first, and this is very encouraging, was the popular enthusiasm among ordinary people to see and protect these elephants. We saw that people do not think of all wildlife species as only bushmeat, and that they can take pride in their conservation. At the same time, we as conservationists have an important job to do to sensitize people to treat wildlife species with caution. The second lesson is the importance of trans-frontier collaboration or cooperation. Elephants know no borders. This is why, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm so heartened to see participants at today's event from across West and Central Africa and indeed beyond. No one of our countries alone can resolve all the issues around the conservation of forest elephants, but we can learn from, from and support each other. Of equal importance is the arrest, investigation, trial, and subsequent sentencing for 10 years in prison of a notorious serial elephant killer. This is in addition to the re-arrest and subsequent detention of 
told us our nationals who fled to neighboring in following allegation of their participation in the killing of two elephants in Liberia. The two suspects have already been charged awaiting prosecution. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, notwithstanding these positive developments, there are challenges as the situation remains critical for the protection of what forest elephants in my country. Liberia has perhaps between 350 to 400 elephants. Deforestation and hunting are some of the bigger threats to our elephants. Farming and other activities are leading to increased human elephant conflict, conflicts, which often results in retaliation against elephants. Perhaps what you would have read in the news, the recent arrest of two men for killing for the killing of two elephants in one of DC National Park in Lofa, Northern Liberia. You might also have read of how one of our rangers was killed in Savo National Park in 2017. These incidents show the potential for serious community tension if we do not manage elephant conservation carefully. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so heartened to see participants of today's uh, event from across West and Central Africa and indeed beyond. No one of our country alone can resolve all issues around the conservation of elephants. We can learn from the support and coordination with other countries. Liberia is keen to acquire the latest expertise and technology on resolving human elephant conflict. Tackling the illegal wildlife trade and stopping illegal deforestation. When we move beyond the coronavirus pandemic, we also believe we have a wonderful potential for tourism that has not yet been exploited. We thank the EPR Foundation for its work in bringing the EPR members' states together today. Rest a show of my girlfriend's commitment to saving Liberia's remaining elephants. God bless the work of our hands as we protect the elephants of Liberia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Dorian in Liberia. Well, we all hear this one recurring theme of human elephant conflict. And on that note, I now want to welcome one of the great experts in this area, Dr. Alexandra Zimmerman from Oxford University. Alexandra also chairs the IUCN SSC Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Winnie. Uh, and thank you to uh, the EPI for organizing this wonderful event. Um, it's been really fascinating to watch the short video so nicely made. And here already from the four countries that we've heard from today about the experiences, both in the legal wildlife trade of elephants, but also in this increasingly emerging issue of elephant conflict in Western and Central Africa. Um, and so this is you know, very symptomatic of, of the wider issue of human conflicts between people and wildlife and conflicts between people about wildlife which affects pretty much every country in the world is increasing rapidly. It's becoming one of the most um, urgent and complex conservation challenges around the world um, for many, many species. Now, when there are elephants involved, it is particularly prominent. That's inevitable, they are impossible to ignore. Um, and so on the one hand, it's slightly worrying to hear from the countries we've heard from today that this is increasingly emerging as a high concern. Um, on the other hand, it's also encouraging to hear in an event like this, that this is be ta being taken extremely seriously at these very high levels. And that is one of the things that is really needed here to make way forward in 
managing human elephant conflict coexistence and managing human wildlife conflicts more widely. And so I have only a few minutes to offer a few thoughts on this topic. Um, but one of the extremely striking things immediately is that this, this issue of ele conflicts over elephants is, uh, is present in around 50 countries. This is uh, in Asia and in Africa. Every country that has elephants grapples with this. It is unavoidable, increasingly so. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't even matter so much how many elephants there are, even the countries, the range states with just a few hundred elephants are seeing these issues uh, grow more and more and becoming more alarming. And so, however, this also means that there is an enormous wealth of experience already out there um, and that there are many um, thousands of conservationists and other experts trying to, to find solutions. What is very tempting, uh, especially under pressure, especially for governments having to do something and, and act on this, is to look for, for simple sol or quick solutions, things possibly technical solutions that can be brought from one place to another that will make the problem go away. And unfortunately, the very hard lesson that we're all learning, those of us working in human wildlife conflict every day, is that that is that is a dead end where we really have to start to share more lessons around um, what we've learned in the process and in particular what has not worked and we have to ask a lot of questions that begin with why not so much what can I take from here and put here to fix this problem but why did it work here or why did it not work here and what is actually going on underneath the, the unfortunate thing is that all of these conflicts with wildlife, they are, they are conflicts between people about wildlife. They appear, of course, to be a direct clash between the animal and the people, and there is that element, but all of them are essentially underpinned by social conflicts. That is simply unavoidable. That makes it much, much more difficult to deal with. As uh, Lee White, said very precisely earlier it is absolutely critical because that we understand and deal with this because if if this is what is undermining support for conservation in a much wider picture not just for the wildlife but for protected areas for the whole package and so like it or not we have to figure out how do we resolve and manage conflicts between groups of people about the wildlife and that unfortunately doesn't entail a lot of technical quick fixes. That means have understanding the dynamics of these situations. All human elephant conflicts are very complex. There are layers and layers of things going on. They are muddled. We've heard from the, today already how some of these issues overlap with illegal wildlife trade. They overlap with um, histories of social tensions around areas. All sorts of things come into the picture. And they're constantly changing. We're dealing with dynamic situations here in which every case, even in, within one country, is different from the next. So how does, one, how does one approach these things? And so I would argue that really we need to also think, change a little bit our way of thinking about these issues. We have to try and invest, and I mean financially and in effort, into actually learning how to uh, mediate conflicts on a much larger scale, because this is what has to come in in order to find long-term solutions. And so, you know, there, is, there isn't much time to go into great detail about all that, although I'd look forward to having um, a little discussions after this. But if I can summarize into maybe three thoughts to go and think about is that it, it all seems a little bit depressing, these conflicts with wildlife, but we have to figure out how to turn these actually into an opportunity to learn at a much deeper level in how we can achieve conservation. Conflict is always uncomfortable, but conflict is something that forces change and you have to try and steer that into a positive direction. Secondly, how do we learn across our boundaries? And that's geographic across all these countries, but also across all the different areas of expertise we have. We have 
amongst us here, biology and social science and all sorts of expertise. And finally, how do we, in the, for the long term, create value, that is valuing of species and wildlife, but also economic direct benefits to help make conservation and elephant conservation sustainable. And that I think we will hear about a little bit more from our next speaker. So I will stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Just on time, <laughs> I was going to ring the bell. <laughs> Thank you very much. And really, you raised some really important issues about the complexity of human uh, elephant conflict. And I would say all of human wildlife conflict. I, I, I can't wait to hear what kind of questions we have um, when we get into the question and answer session. For those of you who joined us, please put your uh, questions in the Q&A. Please remember that we are using two hashtags, hashtag coexistence and hashtag African voices. And I would also like to remind you that if you have not selected a language on the interpretation icon on your screen, the bottom of your screen, there is an interpretation icon. Please select because you'll be able to hear um, what is the proceedings. And now we're moving on swiftly. Um, we're going to listen to our last speaker and uh, he's gonna to talk to us about the value of forest elephants. And we are not talking about them um, in terms of ivory or meat, or, no, no. We're talking about the value of these living animals because our next guest has done some excellent work in some pioneering research in, in, in that regard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by Dr. Ralph Shami of the IMF and Rebalance Act who is going to talk to us about um, uh, you know, the value of elephants. He's joining us from Washington, DC. I hope you have a lot of coffee, Ralph, because it must have been really early for you. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Winnie. Thank you all. Uh, just wanna make sure, are you able to see my screen? Uh, not just now, Do you, are you sharing your screen? Yes, that seems to be working. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Winnie, and thank you, EPI Foundation. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. I also would like to emulate my colleague uh, Alexandra and try to be as uh, succinct as possible. Um, it's uh, and I'm glad I'm the last to speak because listening to the discussion about the the, the troubles and and the challenges facing uh, elephants, forest elephants in particular. Um, but perhaps there's a silver lining in all of this uh, among all of the efforts that everyone is taking to, to help save them. So I tried to put everything in the title. This is the, tit the longest title I've ever put down for a paper or presentation. Uh, one thing is to uh, want to tell you about the elephants as, uh, as um, forest engineers and as also climate engineers. And I want to make the argument that, that uh, recognizing their roles, these dual roles, will lead to not only to better health and um, of course in preserving them and nature, but also to share prosperity. So let me get on with this. I'd like to start the conversation in at, at uh, COP26. Um, I was there um, and uh, there is a recognition now by the world. It's not only about climate change, but that the risk that we are facing, but also the risk of loss of nature and loss of biodiversity and in particular, as not only fauna and not only flora, but also fauna in this respect, loss of elephants also. And the common factor among the two is really human activity is driving all of this. So we are facing a dual risk. And there's also recognition at the COP26 for the first time that perhaps nature could give us the, a, the solution to fighting climate change. So by looking after nature, nature looks after us and maybe we'd be able to mitigate the, the, the climate calamity. Now, when we go directly to, to the, how the world sees the fight against climate change, it, we go to the Paris Accord. And in particular, I'm interested in it because the Paris Accord is the place where uh, countries and, and now firms made commitments towards carbon, carbon reduction, carbon sequestration, carbon neutrality, negative carbon emissions, and so forth. And that created, I'm, I'm a financial economist, I'm not a scientist, for me, that 
that created um, a demand, an insatiable demand for, for ways to sequester or reduce carbon uh, emissions. And, and uh, the question is, where will the supply come from? Okay, how are we going to meet these commitments? Well, despite all the talk about uh, high-tech solutions, uh, which Greta, uh, I like to use something Greta used to call, I call it the blah, blah, blah. The, what's in front of us is nature. Nature has the technology to help us fight the climate change through the sequestration of uh, CO2. And when I was at the IUCN uh, meeting in Marseille, um, you know, they were talking about nature is able to sequester up to 37% of what is needed. And we're seeing signs of that because now since, since the Paris Accord, there's now a market for carbon beyond the, gov the government, you know, prices. There's now a, a market that is coming up, it's developing, and the price of carbon offsets continues to uh, rise and rise. And, and the other day I just read in the, in the Bloomberg uh, on Bloomberg that the price of carbon offsets is geared to go up by 50 fold by 2050. It's not, it's not too uh, surprising because there's an insatiable demand, but the problem is the supply. And what I wanna talk about is the role of nature in, 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 uh, in, in uh, meeting that demand and in particular the role of the elephants. So this is work of scientists, uh, Fabio Berzaghi and colleagues and others who basically uh, found out that the, uh, that the forest elephants, I'm not talking about the savanna elephants, the forest elephants in particular help to sequester carbon in the forest through the way they live and they walk around and uh, the way they forage. And uh, that, that, increase, that increase in the carbon sequestration in above soil is, is about 7%, could be more. And the question is, okay, so, so we have, at least the nature can, can fight climate change through the carbon sequestration. In particular, the elephant, the forest elephants may have a role. And if we, as a financial economist, I looked at this with my colleagues and we thought, well, what would be the value of, of, uh, of, their, of their services? Well, it turns out, if you look at the value of a single elephant over, its, over her lifetime, you've, uh, the, the value of the carbon sequestration alone, we know that forest elephants do a lot of other things, Okay, but we aren't able to measure them in a way that we could put value on them, market value. But if we use just the carbon sequestration alone, on average, one forest elephant can bring alive and well, thriving, doing what she's supposed to do, okay, which is conduct her life, can bring about $1.75 million over her lifetime. Question is, what can you do with that? What is possible to do when you realize that the forest elephants are incredibly valuable in terms of their carbon services to, to what we need to do. How can we harness that, that, uh, that potential? Well, uh, this, is, um, this is work that we're, we're starting to, in, in a sandbox experiment in Gabon with Minister Lee White. Uh, what we can do is actually sell the carbon services of these elephants. To whom? Well, to, the buyers are many now in the market. There are many, could be households, could be firms, could be, could be governments that want to offset their carbon footprint who are willing to pay for the services. We're talking only about the sale of the services, not the elephants at all. The elephants remain owned, owned by, the, by the country in which, which they reside. And we can use blockchain technology to ensure to deal with all the issues that, that are, you know, befell the, uh, uh, the carbon market. So, so we can use blockchain technology to ensure transparency, traceability, and trust. Basically, the buyers of the carbon offsets can pay for the services of the elephants and the carbon offset services of the elephants. And the money can go all the way to look after the elephants and to look after those that look after the elephants, such as the rangers and the local indigenous population who are really the true stewards of nature and of elephants. And just to say here that we can even go beyond the carbon itself to other ecosystem ser services, and we can go also beyond the elephants themselves to the other wond wonderful nature that Africa um, has, okay? So the question is, if we were to do that, what are we really talking about? This is a recent work that we've done for only, only in the protected forests of the following countries. We estimate that in, within Gabon or, or Congo or DRC and so forth, 
we can we can look at income uh, generated just from the sale of the carbon services alone in in the in the hundreds of millions if not in the billions of dollars and that revenue can do the following can create what we call the win win model actually win 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 model win first for nature itself because the money comes in to look after nature and look after natural asset in perpetuity the sellers of what we call the carbon plus, and I'll explain what plus means in a minute, the, the government of the countries would stand to benefit because they're getting revenue. They're getting fiscal savings from the reorienting their spending on, 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 other, on other things. Why? Because the parks would be generating their own income from the sale of the, of the carbon offsets and expansion of the tax base from the income that's coming in will enhance the government's revenue, therefore changing its fiscal stance. Local communities stand to benefit because they get the income through the system I was showing you, the blockchain technology and the inside the digital currency. They get sustainable income, they get meaningful employ uh, employment, they get compensation for any damage from the elephant's uh, human uh, interaction. It, more importantly, it stabilizes communities in their villages and in their towns, and therefore it reduces mobility. So that's a win for the sellers of the carbon offsets. What do the buyers get? They get quite a bit. They get to reduce their carbon footprint. They get to improve on their ESG score. They get to say that they're meeting the SDGs, 1, 8, 10, 13. I'm sure there are more. I just put those that I could, I could recall. And more importantly, they're not buyers of carbon offset. They become an investors in nature. So they get to partner with the countries in terms of saving, saving nature itself. We can, if you want to move away from retail sale of the carbon itself, you can go to the capital markets. And if we use the cap, we use the capital markets to create transferable certificates then that will enhance the liquidity of that market, will create better pricing for the countries, will help market development, and will have in terms of risk management. The most important message here is that conservation is no longer a cost proposition. Conservation becomes a source of capital for sustainable and inclusive development. Most importantly, when you put it all together, if you ask me, what is the blueprint for doing something like this? Well, on the countryside, Countries that have the elephants, what they need to know is what, you know, science comes in. What is it that we have? How many that we have? Where are they? That needs to be done. The valuation then gives the, trans, translate that science, the benefits of the science into the language of the markets. That we need the legal recognition, who owns, who the, the elephants belong to whom, to the communities, to the government, that has to be resolved. And then we need the monitoring. And then when, once all these steps are done, then the elephants, the, the services of the elephants come on the balance sheets of the governments changing their fiscal stance substanti substantially. On the demand side, there's a whole market waiting because the, as I said, the market for carbon is skyrocketing. The demand is insatiable. They're looking for places that can offset their carbon footprint. But most important thing is the principles that would guide such a market. It is, it's imperative that when the money comes in, the money comes in to look after nature in perpetuity. The elephants are sentient beings, just like other animals in this, uh, in this world, and we have a moral and ethical obligation to look after them in perpetuity. Also, the money should come in to create shared prosperity with the local communities and indigenous population through meaningful and sustainable employment, and, and actually they are the true stewards of nature. I'll stop here, thank you. Wow, what a fascinating talk, thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, I'm sure just looking at the question, um, uh, the Q&A, uh, there's a lot of um, questions and issues that have been, have been brought up after that talk. And uh, it's sad that we don't have a lot more time, but this is really fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, now we have had, for those who joined us a little late, we've had so many distinguished speakers. We started in Nigeria, and then we went on to Gabon, Cameroon, Liberia. Then we've had Alexandra, 
uh, Zimmerman and now uh, Dr. Shami. And really, it's been it's been really fascinating. Thank you very much for continuing to use uh, the Q and A, and you can still put more questions into the Q and A because I'm about to open the floor now uh, so that we can answer your questions. Some of our VIPs are staying on um, uh, for sure. I know that Professor Lee White is here to answer our questions, and uh, so. Uh, we will start with you, um, Professor Lee White. I have a number of questions for you, and I'm sure you know that it really has to do with you telling us your success story, because now the questions that follow are, so an increase in elephant Well, I lost you, innit? How do you envisage sustainable management of this increase, this, this elephant numbers? How, how do you um, uh, think you, uh, you know, how, how does your government look at the sustainable management of this? I'm sure it's everything from human elephant conflict to communities um, uh, to illegal wildlife trade. So um, Professor Lee White, you have the floor. You need to unmute, sir. Did you hear? Yeah, me? I think you answered the question for me, Winnie. Um, I heard you. Can you not hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. You can. Okay. Yeah. Um, you answered the question for me, really. I mean, we what we've seen in Gabon in the last twenty years is elephants coming closer to people. Basically, the the when we did the survey in the eighties. There was a 10 kilometer gap along the roads with very few elephants. That gap no longer exists. The elephants have filled up that area. Um, that's one of the reasons we have an increase in human elephant conflict. It's definitely not the only reason. We have poaching in remote areas that pushes the elephants towards people. We have um, a long term issue of reducing fruit production in the rainforest because of climate change. So the elephants are finding less food in the forest and therefore moving out towards people's crops. Um, so yeah, we still have the threat from poaching. So we manage elephants by managing poaching, um, but we're putting more and more and more of our effort into human elephant conflict because um, yeah, it's become a fever pitch issue. It's a political issue. It's a rural livelihood issue. We've just been around all of our nine provinces consulting people locally. We've done a national um, conference on human elephant conflict and the government is working very strongly uh, on the issue. I just spent three and a half hours in the Senate um, and half of what half my time there was spent talking about human elephant conflict. So, so really that, that's how we, yeah, that's the big issue. We're, we're managing it with electric fences that we, we have inspired by Kenya. Um, we're managing it by changing the way we do agriculture, you know, shift, you know, slash and burn agriculture has been around in Central Africa for two and a half thousand years and hasn't changed much forestry to to our country we can be much more productive in terms of farming and we can and we can actually put sort of both climate resilient but also elephant resilient um, farming in place um, we're starting to like can you again pay compensation to, to communities that have of tools and strategies to, to try and um, promote cohabitation, coexistence rather than conflict. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question about communities and how um, you see them kind of benefiting from uh, the conservation of elephants, and 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 I don't know whether you want to just speak to that. How how do you allow and ensure that local people benefit from wildlife tourism? That's a tricky one. In in some places, um, 
where the, we develop tourism, people can de you know, benefit from tourism. Um, I tried to post a photo, I don't know if anybody saw it, but of an elephant on a beach. Um, seeing a forest elephant walking along the Atlantic beach with sort of rainforest in the background. If you're really, really lucky with gorillas in the trees sort of up above them and humpback whales breaching in the background, um, that you can develop tourism and you can create jobs and, and, and livelihoods and, and people who are employed on the back of elephants tend to be much more tolerant of any elephant excesses. But ecotourism can only work in a few flagship sites in, in our forest context at least. And so given that every single rural human being in Gabon has to deal with elephants. There's no forest in Gabon. There's no village in Gabon without elephants. We're, we're kind of the only country on the planet with elephants everywhere. The photo I posted is taken 15 kilometers from central, within kilometers of the presidential palace in downtown Libreville. Um, and, and, and so we can't give tourism benefits to everybody in Gabon. Um, I think a lot of people live with elephants, but get no benefits whatsoever. And, and that's one of the problems. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe if the, the international community engages on elephant conservation, um, we can develop rural livelihoods for people on the back of elephants. If Ralph's numbers, um, you know, prove to be correct, and we can fund um, rural schools and, and, and improved ag agriculture on the back of elephants, that obviously uh, will make people think differ differently about them. Um, but it's a huge challenge right now, because most people only see negative, um, uh, I don't think you can say negative benefits, but people, most people only suffer because of elephants in our, in our country. Very few people um, benefit from elephants today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to speak to any of those questions. Uh, they were very specific to Gabon, but some of the issues are quite general. Or Raf, you know, we, your numbers. Yes. So the <laughs> so so the the uh, the paradigm that we're talking about is really you're flipping things upside down. You're saying. The value, I'm not talking about the intrinsic value, life is priceless. I'm talking about in terms of ecosystem services, in this case, the carbon side is, is basically is saying the a living elephant, thriving elephant is far more valuable to its community, to its country, to the world than a dead elephant. A dead elephant, uh, you all know probably more than I, how much it fetches, unfortunately, 15,000 or 20,000, 40,000, if it's a trophy hunt. But a lifetime earnings from the carbon itself, its, its ability to help sequester carbon in the forest. Um, that's why we, we are starting this sandbox in, in experiment in, in Gabon with Minister Lee White, basically to, to see how we can basically create that market around the, the carbon services of these, of these elephants. That changes the relationship between the elephants and the communities, because right now it's like this. The communities get to see that a live and thriving elephant is bringing me sustainable income and employment and compensation. And so the relationship changes because, and we need to do this fast. We need to do this because people will say a dollar today is much more worth than some expectations of something in the future. The timing is right because right now the world, as I explained, is in, is in dire need of carbon offsets, of technologies that can offset carbon. And the high-tech solutions are a lot of a lot of talk, you know, uh, fascinating talk, but it remains talk. What's in front of us is nature saying, I can help you. I've been around for 12 billion years. There are no surprises except on the upside with me. So we need to harness that and we can do it. We have the technology, we have, this, we have the science, we have the valuation, we have the technology, we have the demand side. So what does it take to do it? And that's why we're keen to start the work in Gabon in order to see how we can do this. And by the way, it can move from the elephants 
to, you know, uh, I, I believe my colleague uh, Ian Redmond is on the, is, is watching us too, to the great apes, I mean, to the other species out there that actually also have a role in this, in this incredible, uh, incredible nature. Thank you, thank you. And Ian, if you're there, hello. Uh, now, Alex, I know you have something to add, but before you do that, let me just put to you some questions. First of all, I've got lots of people saying, uh, this uh, uh, talk was excellent, you know, Ralph, Alex, uh, Professor White, um, there's, there's a lot of people saying this, these were fascinating presentations. So thank you very much. So Alex, there's a question about, are we dancing around um, the issue of human elephant conflict? Um, are we, should we be talking about human population growth uh, when we talk about these issues? Um, what exactly is our response to the issue that the increasing human population is quite uh, a discussion that needs to be had? Uh, there's also a question on uh, ecotourism development, and I, I and I think now you can link that up with what we've heard from Lee. Um, can ecotourism development, uh, basically, I think, in improving the livelihoods of the people. Can, can, can you think of any countries that have maybe used that to mitigate human wildlife conflict? Can, it, can people tolerate elephants better if we improve their livelihoods? Do you have any examples where that has worked? So uh, Alex, please uh, welcome. Thanks, Winnie. Well, Ralph just gave us uh, some very interesting examples right there that, of course, if a, a local community has direct benefit economically from biodiversity, there is a very, very strong incentive there to, to protect that. Um, it is, that's hugely important. So with a species like an elephant, there is more potential to do that because an elephant is a magnificent animal that you know, captures all sorts of interest and imagination. So those approaches in human wildlife conflict can be used for the iconic species. However, it, now speaking beyond elephants, that it doesn't always work because there are conflicts with species which is much more difficult to get these um, ecotourism or other livelihoods benefits from. And even within elephants, that is going to work much better in some areas than in others for logistical reasons and all sorts of uh, other reasons. The, the thing I worry about slightly, and we have seen during these last two years, is that when that income disappears, because there's no more tourism all of a sudden, then you're left with a very fragile situation. And this is where a different kind of value has to come in. And that is the appreciation for the nature and for the wildlife, for deeper reasons, for cultural, spiritual, other reasons. And we tend to neglect that a little bit, but I think we have to actually invest in that too, preserving and nurturing that, because that's the, the all important fallback when the economics fail or when they don't offer a solution. Um, and on the much more thorny question of human population, well, human wildlife conflict at its core is a function of an overlap. If people and wildlife are not coming into contact, we don't really have much human wildlife conflict. So. There, that is inevitably at the root of so many biodiversity con um, conservation issues and for human wildlife conflict, yes. Unfortunately, the, that is the, the state of the world right now. We have to find ways to overlap uh, and coexist. That's the big challenge ahead. Yes, and indeed you said, you know, human elephant conflict is, a, a, you know, coming together of these social issues and, and, and that's why it's so complex. Um, uh, now, I have seen many, many questions directed to Nigeria, and uh, some of them, uh, there's an attempt to answer them on the chat, because um, unfortunately, Honorable Minister uh, uh, from Nigeria was not able to stay with us uh, to deal with some of these questions. So we will endeavor to get answers for you. We, in all our webinars, we do this. We make sure that we deal with the questions and, and get you, uh, you know, answers as much as we can. So we will not be able to deal directly, especially with issues that uh, were directed towards the Honorable Minister from Nigeria, um, but we will endeavor to 
find answers and, 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 and direct uh, whatever we can to you. I am I'm really uh, very grateful that you found uh, the issues around Nigeria uh, very fascinating and you have asked a lot of questions. Um, now, Ralph, can you explain in a little bit more detail how elephant conservation impacts carbon sequestration? I, I don't know whether you want to go back to that. We, we, we have a few minutes, we, we can listen to, to, to you again. I, like I said, your talk is fascinating. Sure. Yeah. So the, uh, I mean, we have um, Minister and Professor Lee White here, who is also a, a, an elephant expert in his own right. The, the work, so basically uh, the work of uh, Fabi Berzaghi and his and colleagues, and they're following it up with other work, shows that the, the way the forest elephants move and forage in the forest, they, uh, the way they, they, their choice of food and the way they traipse on the small shoots, they allow the bigger trees that are the ones that basically can grab carbon to grow bigger and wider and taller. So they have a proclivity for certain kinds of foods that are low in carbon, allowing other species that are high in carbon to, base, uh, to basically thrive better. And because they're walking around, they're traipsing, they're creating more space for sunlight and rain and so forth and nutrients to get to these trees. But they only looked at above, above ground carbon. So we're not even looking at below ground carbon, which, which, is a, which is another benefit. And so what they find is that there's an increase, a delta of 7%, in terms of the carbon sequestration in the forest. And when you lose those elephants, they show in the paper that, they argue in the paper that the, the forest loses its ability. So it's a causality, not a correlation. Now, what you can do with that is basically, so what we did with Fabio is we built the, a population model where you follow the, the elephant in her, through her lifetime. So let's say she lives 60 years and during those 60 years, she may give birth, and so it's a population growth model. So you have you have growth, you know, um, birth rate, death rate, survival rate, and then we follow the we track the overlapping generations of elephants throughout a hundred years, because every every species, every system has a has a carrying capacity. So basically, you're looking at an S-shaped curve, and what we do, we follow the carbon sequestration through, throughout that throughout that lifetime. And then basically what you do, you impose on it a cash flow model because as you have the carbon, once you have the carbon, you can create the cash flow model and you discount it to the present and you ask yourself, how much is that worth? How much the lifetime, the lifetime ability of the elephant and its, its following generations to pick up all this carbon, how much is it worth today? That's what you're really doing. So you really need to start with the science. That's that's, I think, the, the change for us elephants and beyond, because we've done a study on whales, on sea grass, marshes, mangroves. It's all about living systems. You're following their, their, the biological life with all the probabilities and the uncertainties. We can handle all of that. And then you, 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 you ask yourself, how much is that worth, that value to me today? Now, it's happening today because once Paris Accord took place, the world made commitments on carbon zero, carbon neutrality, which created the demand for carbon from the market side. You see, that's why you have a thriving, that's why you have a market that's coming up for carbon. Next year, it'll be biodiversity. Once the regulations come down biodiversity, there'll be a the insatiable demand for biodiversity offsets. So what's happened, you have that demand, so you have a price going up. And what you're really doing is once you have the science, more or less to a point where we can come in as financial economists, then we are using market techniques, which is quite different. Basically, we only look at services for which, for which the, we, can, we have a price and we have a market. There are many services that the elephants provide for which we don't, have a, we don't know what the market price is. You see, if you, for example, seed dispersion, uh, you know, talking to Minister Lee White and to, to Ian and others, you know, all colleagues, they say, well, there's seed dispersion, but we don't know exactly what is the impact of that until the scientists tell us that I cannot come in and value this. I need, so we are not creating the price. We are using the market price, which is very important. Now, how do you do it? Well, you're, you, have, you have this elephant that is creating, as it walks through the forest, as it forages through the forest, is able to increase 
carbon sequestration that is. So you're selling the offsets, let's say to Microsoft. Microsoft says, well, I need to, I need to offset my carbon footprint. Oh, I'm Please. losing you. Oh. I'm losing you. Am I, um, am I back? I've lost Shami. Um, now, Professor White. Hello, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay, sorry, sorry, Ralph, I lost you there for a bit. <laughs> so uh, I'll go. I'll go to That's okay. White. Yeah, Professor White, I'm sure you're listening to all this and you're a scientist, but you're a minister and you do have to sit with your minister for finance and explain <laughs> you know, um, this as an economic model and probably uh, try and figure out whether you need a central clearing house um, to put this fascinating ideas into practice. Uh, how will all the financial models come into play. Do you need to go to talk to the IMF, or you know, do, do you do you need to start talking to 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 the guys um, who who are in big? How how do you talk to your minister for finance about this kind of issues? Just if you speak to that, and then finally, you spoke about the issue of transboundary cooperation and how important it is for conserving elephants. Now, maybe you can just have a quick one on that one, but I'm really interested in hearing, how do you translate this conversation into something that can be consumed by a minister for finance in Gabon or, or, or another country that's grappling with the economics of, of elephant conservation? We're actually trying. I mean, we don't need to talk to the IMF because Ralph is from the IMF, so. That helps. Um, <laughs> you know, you, Ralph and I are having quite a debate about um, the kind of stress test, the science and the economic theory behind all of this. Um, that's why he talks of a sandbox, uh, which is a, a concept where we might get um, we might get some sort of funding to really kickstart the science and dig deeper um, um, before we can actually promise any sort of carbon credit or biodiversity credit to people. Um, because as, as you say, if, whether it's going to my finance, my, my colleague, the finance minister, uh, but even more so in the international market where Gabon is looking to sell carbon, yeah, more classic carbon credits. Um, your, the, 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 your ability to sell carbon and your ability to achieve the right price for it depends 100% on your reputation. And there are a lot of sort of carbon bandits, carbon cowboys out there. Um, and so Ralph and, and, and his colleagues and my colleagues, and you know, we've brought in people like Edwin de Mali from Oxford and Kate Abinetti from Sterling. Um, we're really looking at how we, how we dig deep into the science to, to prove all of this before we go too far. Because yeah? if you make false promises and you, if you sell hot air or, or um, you then become labeled as a carbon charlatan, um, and none of us want that because then we won't be able to do uh, all of the good that we think we can do with this, uh, with these ideas. So, so I think step by step, re remaining, um, maintaining integrity, yeah, deepening the science and the understanding economics, um, and we'll see where we get to. But it's 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 a very exciting prospects. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I can say on the cross-border issue. Um, ivory markets are not in Africa, as a rule, and the 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 end markets are not in Africa, and so for all of the African countries, um, ivory is a cross-border issue. In some cases, ivory is moving between our countries. Um, and there we have, you know, governments have to work together to eliminate that because when you, when you trace 
the groups that are moving this ivory or 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 or, or you trace at least uh, where the ivory ends up it tends to end up in organized criminal groups and and terrorist groups it doesn't mean that every person involved in ivory is a terrorist and there are plenty of low level poachers and and traders who who are not but but that the end destination tends to be in these criminal cartels and 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 those are very bad for african countries they can even in some instances destabilize countries um, and so we all have to fight together to eliminate this illegal cross-border commerce to regulate it in the CITES sense um, and to look at the flows between the African continent elsewhere um, and and the price we will all pay if we don't do that is 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 severe um, and so more government to government collaboration on wildlife crime um, we and, um, and EPI have been pushing for a for a protocol um, dedicated to um, wildlife trafficking um, and the international fight against it and, and we're hoping that we'll gain international support for that um, John has been very active on that and maybe he'll say a word or two about it before the end of our of our uh, webinar thank you unfortunately like all good things you know you run out of time and uh, but i would just maybe ask the panelists like one parting shot one last thing you would like to say before we we close um and i'm going to ask uh, dr alexandra zimmerman uh, just one last thing that you would like to say keep it short but you know <laughs> just one last thing maybe before we close. Um, I think it's just that these are highly complex problems that need lots and lots of brains to work together. And so the one thing we need to do is bring all these ideas, experiences. Um, I think there were some suggestions about how do we continue talking and sharing ideas and um, finding the way forward. That's what we need to do. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ralph. I've um, I spent 23 years at the IMF working on low income, fragile states um, and um, and being on the ground. Um, this new paradigm where where you value a living and thriving nature can really is a really game changer. It's a, really a divorce from the extractive view of nature, and we really need to move from that for our own. For our, to, 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 to ensure our own survival. So this paradigm where you put a value on a living and thriving nature can, is a real game changer. And by the way, Winnie, you won't need the tourist dollars because if, the, if you're looking after your nature, nature looks after you, you get better health. And to be able to actually sell its services, then whether the tourists come or don't come, doesn't really matter. That's how powerful this thing is. And it keeps people in their villages and in their towns. And we're, it's beyond just the elephants. I know we're talking about the, it's about, it's a recognition of biodiversity because when we talk about the elephants, the elephants are interacting with the soil, with the trees, with the air, with everything. So when you're saying the elephant is adding, it's really you're valuing biodiversity itself. And as I learned from my colleague, Ian Redmond, it's not about the flora. It's not about planting trees. Mm -hmm. A forest with no animals is a dead forest. Yes. It's about the flora and the fauna interacting, creating the beauty and the intricacy of life. So regenerative earth, nature, economy is, to my mind, is the most exciting idea. And for our own survival, we really need to move fast on that. I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Professor Lee, I don't know if you have one last thing to say or are you good? I can't add to those very eloquent words, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Sadly, we are out of time. I want to just thank everyone who joined us and everyone who was able to stay up to the end. Um, you know,
closing, let me say that this debate will continue. The EPI Foundation uh, will be holding more of this Pan-African discussions in, in coming months. Um, and, and of course, today's entire event will be shared online. I want to extend my thanks to the EPI Foundation, uh, the CEO, John Scanlon. He spoke to us at the beginning of um, this presentation, there's a whole team working uh, hard in the background, uh, Barnaby, uh, Yi, Victoria, um, Andrew, the whole EPI team that are out there supporting um, this webinar from the background and doing all the background work that has brought us to this day. I just want to extend a really um, a, a big thank you because without you, we wouldn't even be able to do this. Finally, I would like to thank the Leventis Foundation and also the World Tourism Forum one last time for having provided the funding um, that enabled us to do a lot of this work. Um, so I just want to give each of you a hand clap and, and just say thank you very much. I, I would ululate, but you know, uh, um, it's the African way of saying thank you and, and I can do it. But those of you who don't know how it goes, you might think I've suddenly gone, gone nuts. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to just say <laughs> thank you very much. Do have yourself a good day, a good evening, good night, wherever you are. We look forward to having you during our next discussion. Thank you very much from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.